Hi there, I'm Dr. McFerrin with DM Explains. In this video, I'm going to be talking about engineering discipline. So here is a non-exhaustive list of different types of engineering. There are so many disciplines within engineering, civil, mechanical, aeronautical, manufacturing, materials, electrical, computer, mechatronics, engineering, physics. I could go on. Nuclear, for some reason, is represented twice in my list. Must be really important. Those that I'm highlighting are those which are present at my university. But what differentiates one discipline from another? Well, the answer is the type of problem they solve. The skills required of a mechanical engineer versus an electrical engineer versus a computer engineer and so on depends entirely on whatever type of problem they are trying to solve. Uh, cut, 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 snip, snip, snip. What differentiates the types of engineering is just the problem that they solve. Most engineering projects require a multidisciplinary group of engineers working on it. So you may have mechanicals and electricals and materials and mechatronics engineers all working together on the same problem, but they're solving different sub-problems within that. For example, a cell phone. A cell phone has material properties which are important. It has mechanical properties, different stresses and production strains that go on it. It has electronics within it. It has software that runs on those electronics. All of those things become important. Before we launch into more about specific types of engineering, the first thing I want to point out is what engineering is not. Engineering may contain some of these skills, but this is not the whole of engineering. Engineering is not just drafting. An engineer may use drafting as part of solving problems. They may use computer-aided design tools in order to do that. But the job is not that the finished product is a draft or drawing. Engineers are not electricians. I get asked all the time, hey, can you help me wire your house? And my answer is no, because electricians are skilled laborers who go through an apprenticeship program to learn how to specifically deal with higher power wiring. There's certainly some wiring in electrical engineering, but that is not the end goal. The end goal is much different and involves different types of trainings. Engineers are not mechanics. So if you have a mechanical engineer, I don't know that you would necessarily ask them to fix your car. Maybe they are an exceptional individual and they know how to fix a car, but they're not mechanics. Again, sort of like electricians, these are people that are skilled and trained in that field and engineering, while we may understand how the mechanics work, sometimes we're pretty useless with tools. Engineers also are not specifically people who do machining and fabrication. Again. This is a trade or a technical skill which is important for engineering, but is not the whole. Engineering may contain all of these parts, but if you are interested in being an electrician and wiring houses or doing other types of wiring, you should go through an apprenticeship program and learn how to do that. That's a very important and different skill that I would highly recommend if that's for you. So let's talk about electric so let's talk about mechanical engineering. Mechanical engineering may solve problems like machine design, manufacturing, energy production, control systems, which is my specialty. Notice I'm an electrical engineer, but my specialty is listed under mechanical engineering. Materials, transportation, robotics, biomedical applications, all of these are examples of mechanical engineering in action. Electrical engineering includes power generation and distribution, communication systems, again, control systems, dealing with electromagnetic waves and radiation, like the antenna in my phone is an electrical engineering problem, integrated circuit design, process instrumentation and control, robotics, telecommunications, signal image processing, machine learning, I could go on. Computer engineers may work in some of the same sorts of fields, communication systems, computer interface design, computer networking, digital systems, embedded systems, and so on. So the point is that there are so many different things within each discipline that there are just huge horizons available for you, whichever discipline you pick. It is important to pick a discipline, though, that you find passion or enjoyment in. Just as a graphic, 
we can put up a little bit dated, but some information about popular majors. So if I look at the 2013-2014 bachelor's degrees awarded by engineering discipline, there were about 100,000 degrees awarded. And of those, about 25% were mechanical engineering. Civil made up about 12%, electrical about 11, although you'll see electrical and computer represented down here for another almost 3%. So together, roughly 13% electrical. If I come all the way over to here, I've got computer engineering, right around 4.2%, and then there's all sorts of other types of engineering. So if I were looking at the disciplines that my university offers, between half and two thirds of the students to pick mechanical engineering, the rest would be split roughly 75% to 25% electrical and computer engineers. One of the things that comes along with an engineering discipline is an engineering professional society. Engineering professional societies provide you with access to be current with the pulse of what's going on in your discipline. So IEEE is the Institute for Electronics and Electrical Engineers, or maybe I got that order wrong, but IEEE is the Electrical and Sometimes Computer Engineering Professional Society. ASME is the American Society for Mechanical Engineers. Uh, there's also ASCE, which is Civil Engineering. Uh, ACM, which is computing. All of these are professional societies that you can be involved in, and the value to you is that, again, it allows you to be aware of innovation in those fields. It allows you to get involved volunteering with those groups. They often provide technical talks, which get you exposure to what's going on. There's networking opportunities, and it's more or less expected of many professionals that they'll be belong to an engineering professional society. The other thing to talk about when I talk about engineering disciplines is the concept of a professional engineer. I'm in Indiana, so I'll look at the state of Indiana's definition of a professional engineer. The state of Indiana defines a professional engineer as an individual who, by reason of that individual's special knowledge of the mathematical and physical sciences and the principles and methods of engineering analysis and design, which are acquired by education and practical experience, is qualified to engage in the practice of engineering as attested by that individual's registration as a professional engineer. What that means is if you have appropriate training and experience, you can register to be a professional engineer. Now, I'll tell you more about what a professional engineer is and what the value of getting a professional engineering license looks like in a minute, but let's talk about the process to get there. So how do we become a professional engineer? First, we have, there are pre-engineering programs in mathematics and sciences, but don't ignore communication skills, writing, oral, visual communication. Two, get accepted to and complete a Bachelor of Science degree from an ABED accredited engineering school. My engineering school has ABED accreditation in mechanical, electrical, and computer engineering. Then you take and pass the fundamentals of engineering exam. You then serve as an engineer in training for a period of time supervised by a professional engineer. At your work, you may find someone who is there to mentor you and to check off on your designs. They are the professional engineer. You're the engineer in training. You are still technically an engineer. You are just not a registered licensed professional engineer. Then you will take and pass a professional engineering exam. This is an exam that you take after several years in the profession and it is essentially the check gate to get you that licensure as a professional engineer. Now as a student one thing I will encourage you is to take the fundamentals of engineering exam seriously. A couple years ago I had a student who graduated past his FE and it resulted in a $5,000 pay increase. So companies take it seriously, particularly if you're doing any sort of consulting or government work, professional engineer is a really good thing. The FE exam is typically the first step in the process that leads to a PE license. There's way more information about that that we don't need to talk about at this moment. And then the PE exam is an eight hour exam which goes over your specific discipline and this is after you've spent some time working in the field. A professional engineer must continue education even after school. There is continuing education requirements. This does not mean get a master's degree or a PhD. What this means is that you're staying current in your field. You're devoted to lifelong learning. But as a professional engineer, you can sign and stamp drawings, which means you are personally saying, 
that because of your engineering expertise, this design is safe. This is very prestigious. Professional engineers are highly valuable. It should be on par with a MD or a PhD. That's all I have about engineering disciplines and what it means to be a professional engineer. In this video, I'm doing a super, super quick rundown on what estimation is and how we can do it. So here are some tips to perform estimation. We want to determine the accuracy required. Is an order of magnitude enough? In other words, if it's within a factor of 10, good enough. Is plus or minus 25% good enough? I will not lie to you, in my graduate program, there were, were a ton of times that I literally wrote on a napkin at a restaurant, estimating out the result of an experiment, which we could then test in the lab. Remember that a ballpark value is often good enough for an input parameter. So the square footage of a typical house, you could say, all right, typical house in Rhode Island might be at like 1,200 square feet. In the Midwest, it might be 2,000 square feet. Ballpark is good enough. It doesn't have to be exact. The typical velocity of a car on the highway. Well, you could make an assumption about what the speed limit is and what people actually drive. And that ballpark value is often good enough as an estimate. The next thing you want to do is ask if it's better to err on the high side or the low side. Does the estimate deal with safety? You then want to err on the thing that's more safe. If we're dealing with safety, for example, is it better to err on the high side or low side for how much weight a bridge can support? Well, the answer is I want to err on the low side so that way, it, even if I'm wrong, I can still support a minimum amount of weight. Then, once you've made your estimate, then you can improve the estimate. You can improve it by looking at how much rounding might impact the result. And I want to point out to not get bogged down with second order or minor effects. If you're, for example, if you're estimating the mass of the air in a classroom, does it matter whether or not there's furniture in there? For the purpose of an estimate, you can probably just find the dimensions of the classroom and figure out how much the mass of the air in that classroom are from there. So there are different types of estimation, and I'm going to hit those quickly. Estimation by analogy, so I'm comparing one thing to another. In the game 20 questions, usually one of the classic questions is, is it, better, is it bigger than a bread box? So I can compare it by looking at something that I know the size of. I don't know what the heck a bread box is, but maybe you say, is it bigger than a toaster? and you have an image in your mind. The next is an estimation by aggregation. Are there a bunch of discrete small parts that I can break up? If there's a small part, I can figure out the size of that part or estimate the size of that part and then multiply that to fill the space or to meet the parameters I'm looking for. I can also estimate using upper and lower bounds. What is the absolute max and absolute min that I might get? I could also estimate using modeling. So I could use a simple mathematical model and either do it by hand or use a computer program to figure out an estimate of performance of a system. That's all I wanted to talk about in my very, very brief introduction to estimation as an engineer. If you have any questions, let me know. Put them in the comments below. But for now, that's all. So thanks for watching.